opportunity to introduce um, Buddhism in Taiwan, Theravada Buddhism in Taiwan. And uh, I will talk about this in terms of four topics. First of all, of course, about history, and then the two groups, the one established by foreign monks and the ones established by Taiwanese monks and the factors why people in Taiwan may be interested or even attract to Theravada Buddhism. And then lastly, if I still got the time, stop me if I don't. Uh, if I still got time, the tension, the possible tension with the mainstream Buddhism in Taiwan. So basically, Buddhism in Taiwan has a relatively short history. It probably come to Taiwan with the Chinese migration the largest scale of Chinese migration occurred only in 17th century, but during the earlier periods, because there was no religious uh, professions, so it was mostly, we say that it was mostly lay Buddhism. And then we have become a Japanese colony. And then after 1945, after war, Taiwan was um, Chinese nation's government or KMT government come to Taiwan. After 1949, there was a large number of Chinese Buddhist monks. They come to Taiwan because of the communists take over of mainland China. And this, perhaps by coincidence or not, most of them are reformist monks. They want to reform what they see that um, degradation of Chinese Buddhism in mainland China. So in, when we study Buddhism in Taiwan today, we would just mostly say that Buddhism in Taiwan today is human still Buddhism or what we call Buddhism for the human realm. And, but because that's only because the larger Sanghas all carry the banners of Renjian Fo Jiao, Buddhism for the human realm. And then it was 1987, the leaf of martial law that is very significant because only after 1987, we have more freedom for religious parties. And then we see significant growth of Theravada Buddhism in Taiwan. However, it does not mean there was no earlier exchange between Theravada Buddhists and the Buddhists in Taiwan. I have two pictures here. They are copied from the digital lights of the Buddhist magazine called Nanyang Buddhism, was published during the Japanese colonial time. We see that this article in 1929 talks about Buddhism, a Buddhist conference in Myanmar, and this article in 1931 talks about Buddhism in Thailand. So we see that even in the earlier 20th centuries, we have records of Buddhist exchange between Taiwan and Theravada countries. But by and large, the mainstream of Buddhism in Taiwan is the monastic form of Chinese Buddhism. So we still say that Buddhism in Taiwan is uh, within the Chinese Buddhist tra tradition. And this, we see the statistic here is by the government. And uh, we can see that after 1987, there are more freedom of religions. And in the 1929, there are so many religious groups in Taiwan. And some of them, some of the religions, I don't know even know what they are. But so, and then those are just the organization bothered to, with the government. And there are even more who cannot bother to register with the government. So we can see that after 1987, there is a lot of diversity of religious belief and parties in Taiwan. But religious identity is always a contentious issue in Taiwan. And we cannot even say how many Buddhists are here. For example, this is survey done by Academia Sinica. We see that even people who quite who identify themselves as Christians may also believe in Buddhism or in Taoism, and the Buddhist people who identify themselves as Buddhists also share religious beliefs of other tradition. And in fact, most people I know in Taiwan. Who 
participate in different religious groups, sometimes even different religions. So this whole idea about the Buddhist identity is very contentious and very debatable here. And then it here again is government statistic. Uh, from the child alone, we, we might see that the Buddhism is in decline because the number of Buddhist members of organizations are declining. However, I think more interesting is the statistic in 2012. All of a sudden, there seems to be more Buddhist groups. So it probably suggests that we have so many more Buddhist tradition here. And we, even though the mainstream Buddhism is still Chinese Buddhism, there are still small ones. And in fact, the scholar would suggest that Tibetan Buddhism is not very popular here. And um, Theravada is here, but not as many followers as Tibetan Buddhists. So in terms of history of Bodhi Theravada Buddhism in Taiwan, I will roughly divide it into three period. The earlier period before 1987, there was a little, just very, very little exchange between Buddhists in Taiwan and the Theravada Buddhists, probably they mostly carry out in Buddhist conference, such as World Buddhist Sangha Council. But in terms of like formally introducing to Taiwan, probably not very much, right? Uh, even though there are records of like, um, uh, Buddhist monks coming to Taiwan, but the Theravada monks coming to Taiwan, but we still have no idea what they did here. But mostly only after 1987, we see a significant growth of Theravada Buddhism here. So the first Theravada Buddhist book in Taiwan was published in 1989. And afterwards, there was so a significant growth, a significant publication of Theravada books. But in the earlier period, all of them were like translated, not from Thai language or Burmese language, but they are translated from English. And then they are mostly books written by modernists, if we want to talk about Buddhist modernists. They are mostly written by modernist monks such as Buddha Dasa, Gohinga, Power Sayado. So I have never done a comprehensive survey about why people here want to translate Theravada Buddhist books into Chinese. But when I ask around, mostly they give the answer like, oh, Theravada Buddhist books are easier to understand and practice and they are most relevant to real life. Um, by that, it probably means that because the Chinese Sutra was translated over 1,000 years ago, uh, language changed. So even nowadays, students have to be specially trained in order to understand Chinese Sutra. So probably because of that, people find teachings by those modernist Theravada monks easier to understand and practice. And the significant uh, change, turning point come in 1995, when the Burmese India meditation teacher, Gohinka, was invited to teach, to host a meditation retreat in Taiwan. So after her retreat, somebody just donated a name to a Vipassana meditation movement. So big after that, beginning in 1995, we see uh, Theravada institutes, institutes in Taiwan. So in terms of the Gohinga, in addition to that, we also see the Dhammakaya also established their branch temple in Taiwan. And then there were also Taiwanese groups. They, they started establishing their own organization here. So I'm going to talk about these two categories. The ones established by foreign groups, 
and they are mostly some of them are transnational groups. So something like uh, Dhammakaya Temple of Thailand. They come to Taiwan mostly for missionary purpose or um, for caring for the Thai migrants because there is actually a significant number of Thai migrants in Taiwan. So in Dhammakaya Temple, it's interesting is that you see also Thai devotees and the local Taiwanese devotees partisan together and they also invest a large amount of time translating their texts into Chinese. So Dhammakaya, I know this have more than one temples and uh, quite a lot, mostly in where there is a large number of Thai migrants. And there are also the division temples for Gohinka and also for Pawa Sayado. Pawa Sayado actually come to Taiwan until recently. He actually come to Taiwan almost every year to host Dharma talk and the meditation retreat. So those groups are more interesting, are uh, most likely like uh, uh, missionary. They're trying to introduce their Theravada Buddhism to Taiwan. And very few are established by Theravada students in Taiwan, like this monk, Changding Ma from Sri Lanka. He was in Taiwan as a student as the beginning in 1989, and then he stayed. He established his own temple in Taipei, and it would become so successful. It, he actually was a, able to establish a Buddhist university back home in Sri Lanka. All these groups share the com, uh, common characteristics that like they emphasize or promote meditation, meditation practice. So if you read all those academic research papers, they will say, oh, why Taiwanese are interested in Theravada Buddhism, meditation, meditation, meditation. But based on my informal and scientific observation with Dhammakaya and the Chandima's temple, actually reach, reach uh, the idea of making good karma is also very important. There is a significant number of Taiwanese who began to participate in Dhammakaya and the Chandima's temple not because they are interested in the doctrine, not because they are interested in meditation, but they see the monk, those Theravada monk, has great magical power. Or like they can, they would do charity work back home in Thailand or in Sri Lanka, and the that charity work will help them to accumulate the karma. So this is also one aspect that is not so much mentioned in scholarly uh, discourse. And then there's Taiwanese group. The ta there are actually, as far as I know, maybe there are small ones, I do not know. There are two Theravada Sangha established by Taiwanese monks in Taiwan. So one is called Dhammaran, the other is called Sambodhi Sangha. They or the both of them emphasize that they are not Theravada Buddhism. They are original Buddhist organization. So you see some body Sangha, their, um, their association is actually called Original B Buddhism Society. So they all advertise themselves as original Buddhism. There is this drive to search for original Buddhism and then they also emphasize meditation. Meditation is a main focus of lay Sangha. They host regular meditation retreat for lay people. They regularly invite meditation teachers from Myanmar, from Thailand, or from Sri Lanka to, to teach in Taiwan. And the very strangely, they, unlike Theravada tradition, both Sanghas uphold the authority of Chinese Agama. I think that's 
for them, they perceive Chinese agama also a sutra from earlier Buddhist history and therefore reflect original Buddhism. So there's this drive for searching for original Buddhism, but the most interesting or most significantly is their international tie. The founder of Dharma Ren Sangha spent many years living in the United States, and then he was ordained in Thailand, and then in 1996, he came back to Taiwan to establish uh, his own organizations. And then there's uh, the founder of Sambodhi Sangha. He spent many years doing meditation and trained in Myanmar before he come back to establish his own organization. So you can see that English plays a very important role here. And then there is this uh, international time. But most importantly is this whole idea of original Buddhism. So original Buddhism, you can see, is um, it's kind of this orientalist idea that the Mahayana Buddhism was historical, historical later development, and perhaps is um, not real Buddhism at all. And someone who is influential and uphold belief in this idea is Master Tai Xu. Master Tai Xu was this reformist monk in mainland China at the turn of the 20th century. He influenced many Buddhist leaders in Taiwan um, of later time, of later um, 20th centuries. So today we see that um, Buddhi the mainstream of Buddhism in Taiwan is what we call Buddhism for the human realm. That idea actually comes from Master Tai Xu. And Master Tai Xu has this idea of original Buddhism as somehow he idealized Salaam or Sri Lanka. Earlier was this um, belief that uh, Salaam is where you can find original Buddhism. So he actually sent his monk disciples to study in Salaam. And unfortunately, all of them disrobed later on. However, it's not entirely a failure mission. Some of them disrobe and convert to another religion. Some of them disrobe and become very important translators of Theravada texts. For example, one of the one of the stu monk students who went to Siddham is Ye Jun, is not called Ye Jun. He translated so many Theravada texts that almost every textbook I use for my Theravada class come from his translation. But in any case, this idea of original Buddhism linger on and is still being perceived and promoted in Taiwan today. So, for example, we see this nunnery, it's called Nanning Nunnery. So, by the look of it, you see them dressed in Theravada robe, and they also have a Theravada style stupa. However, they study Mahayana texts. They chant Mahayana Sutra and study Mahayana doctrines. And for them, the, the reason to follow Theravada Vinaya, not because they convert to Theravada Buddhism, but because they are actually trying to uh, practice what is original Buddhism. So there's this inference of original Buddhism, but then umbralization play a very important role here. Uh, I read from somewhere Taiwan is the second highest published dance country in the world. And so most of the people in Taiwan actually live in cities of Western coast. And so it's so dense. And what happened when you live in cities is that you lost this connection with what we call ritual circle in their home village. So scholars of Chinese religion would suggest that 
in Chinese religion, orthodoxy is more important than orthodoxy. It's not about what you believe, but about your content, content, and about what you practice. And uh, since they move to cities, they become um, disconnect with their home, their home village ritual circle, and then they will begin to participate in religions that are less associated with localities. And meditation is one of it. So we see all those uh, these Theravada groups, they stress the importance of meditation. And then, so people from the cities could just take seven days or 10 days off from work and go to those meditation centers and sort of have a break there. And since the meditation teachers at the beginning don't really focus on religious aspect, some of them who participate in meditation would not consider it as Buddhist. Only later on, if they participate in more and more meditation, they probably would switch from this idea of orthopraxy and then move into a more orthodoxy doctrinal, doctrines uh, discourse, sorry. So meditation is a very important, and of course, Buddhist rituals, Buddhist ceremonies, unlike traditional Chinese religions, do not focus on a locality or like a certain village or certain families. It's quite universal, so it's easier for people who participate in Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, ceremonies. So I would say urbanization it also contribute to the growth of Theravada Buddhism in Taiwan. And this also something localization. Localization not just means that you translate everything from Pali or from English into Chinese, but it also means you can somehow connect with people, the Taiwanese people who do not have very good concept about Buddhism. Like I said earlier, in the Chinese religion, orthodoxy is more important than orthodoxy. So most of people will not know the difference between Mahayana or Theravada. They will attract to Theravada groups for all kinds of reasons. Meditation is one, but the rituals is also another one. So this is this Sri Lanka group. Uh, founded by the monk I talked about this before, Chandima Thero. And here is a photo. He's taking the photo with a pure name monk and also a, Tibet, a monk from Tibetan tradition who come to visit his temple. Uh, he's one of, his group is one of those who localize most in Taiwan. So we see in temples, there's also shrines of um, Mahayana Chinese Bodhisattva, which you don't really see in Theravada groups. And you also see they have this Zhongyuan Fa Hui, which translated into English as goes festival. And so it was carried out mostly in terms of Chinese ritualistic um, style that uh, you have written here, uh, this where you you transmit your merit to and you burn inside in the way Chinese Chinese would do. However, throughout my almost 20 years association with this group, I've never seen it doing any uh, chant anything that is Mahayana everything they chant or teach come from Pali texts. Even though Pali texts was translated into Chinese, so that the local people will be interested, uh, will understand what's going on. So as Chandima Thero, his temple grows in Taiwan, he become able to 
establish a university back home in Sri Lanka. And here we see he's going to, he's increasingly, increasingly give his temple in Taipei to two younger monks. The two younger monks would teach Pali text, teach meditation. So we see actually a divide found between the earlier devotees and the later devotees. The later devotees who attend Pali study course, uh, attend the meditation course, will be come on, will be more um, will be more strict about Theravada followings, like they will insist on not to worship a Bodhisattva or the wearing white during puja, or they will insist uh, not to participate in other religions. But for the older generation, the older divorce, <laughs> there was kind of like, um, they were complaining about that because for them it's kind of, uh, this temple is supposed to be a combination of their own tradition and the Theravada tradition. But in any way, my point is, when you, this is one of the successful case here, because the degree of its localization is able to attract a large number of Taiwanese devotees to here. So uh, its degree is here. And then you must ask if there is any tension between Buddhist establishment in Taiwan and those Theravada Buddhist groups in Taiwan. Uh, the point to begin is that we must understand there is no central Buddhist authority in Taiwan. That means there is no one government body can tell you, oh, this is wrong, this is right. So pretty much even if there is tension, it occurs only in social media, in internet. We don't face, we, there is no face-to-face -face conflict. So in terms of the tension, very interesting is the feminist critique. Many people here, uh, as far as I can tell from internet, will feel very uncomfortable how the meditation center in Burma treat women or even this photo, this photo, the first photo here is especially interesting. Here is the power Sayado, and here is the most active, um, most advocate, sorry, uh, most aggressive feminist nuns in Taiwan, Fernbo Zhao Hui. She is a social activist and she is very vocal about feminist issue from Garudama to Bikuni ordination even to legalization of same-sex marriage. She is for that. And for some reason, she and Pawa Sayato had a very good relationship. Pawa Sayato, whenever he come to Taiwan, he will go to her nunnery to preach or host meditation for a few days. So we can see this, even if there is attention, it's always kind of exists only in internet. People don't really do that face to face. But the most in, uh, tension will come from the Taiwanese Theravada groups. They have the strongest anti-Mahayana sentiment. Those foreign groups always try to uh, sort of localize or even accommodate the local, the mainstream Mahayana Buddhism here, but it's only by the um, Taiwanese groups who, of, who come out very strongly oppose Mahayana tradition. So, so much so you can see this photo here, they will try to imp implement Mah Theravada tradition that here giving dana in terms of goods rather than money in Taiwan. In Chinese tradition, we usually give dana in terms of money rather than materials. So this is one tradition they try to change. But one ten, well, most the attention come from this uh, hostile to Mahayana tradition, come from this monk, Mahinda. He was 
He's actually from mainland China and based in mainland China. He come to Taiwan a few times, but thanks to internet, his teachings and his books are available in Taiwan. So he's most hostile, not just in terms of parties, but in terms of tax, in terms of the canons. So he advocated that we need to translate sutras again. Oh, the existing Chinese sutras or the existing uh, Chinese Buddhist terms that is known to everyone. He suggests that we all need to translate it again because earlier for him, he suggests that the earlier translation was from Sanskrit rather than from Pali. So the pronunciation is different. The pronunciation is wrong. So he suggests that we need to do uh, the, this translation again, right? So we can see this this movement towards orthodox beliefs and practice of Theravada Buddhism. But this anti-Mahayana sentiment or this the suggestion by the Mahinda, this Mahinda Thero is mostly meant criticized on internet. People will say that what language change, pronunciation change, or like uh, he's too intolerable and uh, a lot of things. But anyway, let's cut it tension. Still carry on, but it's not to face to face uh, conflict. All right, I think um, my talk is about today, 30 minutes already. Right, thank you. I will end it now. Thank you so much, um, Wei. Um, that was so interesting. I learned so much, not just about Theravada in Taiwan and the different groups, but also about the history of Buddhism in Taiwan and a little bit about political background too. I'm going to hand over right. to Angela to chair the questions, but I just wanted to apologise. I was so excited to talk about our history and your past, uh, our shared past, uh, that I forgot to tell people where you are now. And I just want to say that Wei Yi Cheng is, uh, Cheng is the Associate Professor in Buddhism, Buddhist Studies at Fuquan University in Jiaoxi in Taiwan. Uh, over to you, Angela. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Kate, I need to ask you one question. Uh, are you going to record the Q&A from here? Uh, yep, we're going to carry on recording. Um, so if people don't want to be recorded, if they could use the chat and we'll read it out, if that's okay. Olivia said she's going to look look at keep an eye on the chat. Um, okay, great. So, uh, so if you don't mind being recorded, then please use the uh, hand uh, hand icon on the floating menu bar on your screen to ask your question, uh, or you may use the chat to to type your question. And if you don't want to be recorded. Uh, then it's better if you use the chat to ask your question. Um, so now we'll we'll open for questions. Uh, I see Kate's hand raised, but uh, as she's the host, is there any guests that would <laughs> yes that who we should defer to out of politeness? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't barge in with that. Um, um, if there are uh, other people who would yes, like to, yes, I see uh, Pamoda. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you for the talk. Uh, basically, I'm a, I'm a Tavada monk uh, based in, in Malaysia, in Taiping. And uh, I'm very interested, I speak Chinese. Uh, I've been um, in China for several years um, in mainland, and I'm mainly interested in early Buddhism. So that's what we do here. We read the uh, suttas in Bali. Uh, and I, we do a uh, comparative study as well with, uh, from uh, Bonte Analayo um, work. And uh, I'm interested in going to Taiwan and I would like to be uh, able to find some interesting places to go. I, I, noted, um, I noted those, those two Taiwanese groups like Dhamma Rain and Sambodhi Sangha, if I if I heard well, and I would be interested in uh, in knowing more about them and uh, maybe having some contact there if it's possible. Well, yes, they are easily. Uh, you can they are easily to be found on the internet. Just key in the Google the keywords. Their their organization name, then you can find. 
they are very easy to find. Is it Dharma Rain? And Dharma Rain and uh, uh, original Buddhism society. Okay. Um, yeah. I, actually, maybe I could I send you a mail and and uh, because I, I cannot hear clearly the name. Can you can, can I send you a mail and you can just yes send? yes yes I have already key in my email on the chat. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On the chat box. Yes. Thank you. Thank right. you very much for your for your, You're for your job. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate, would you like to ask your question, please? <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, so the first is that, you know, your book was about uh, about comparing nuns in Taiwan and Sri Lanka. At that point, you were comparing Mahayana nuns and in Taiwan with Theravada Vinaya nuns in Sri Lanka. Um, now, it looked like one of your images was of Taiwanese Theravada nuns. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a little bit about the presence of Theravada nuns and whether that's a bhikkhuni ordination lineage and how all that has worked out. And um, yeah, and so yes, how the attitude right. to bhikkhunis in Theravada country translates. So that's my first question. Shall I, I'll come back with a second after you answer that, if, um, if that's okay. Uh, actually, this group of nuns, uh, I think you are talking about this, right? They don't see themselves as Theravada yeah. nuns. They right. see themselves as a bhikkhuni of original Buddhism. So they actually study Mahayana doctrines and they chant Mahayana Sutra, Chinese Sutra. Is they only follow um, Theravada Vinaya because they see Theravada Vinaya is closer to to um, original Buddhism. That's it. They so still perceive know, themselves as Mahayana. So if they're following a Theravada Vinaya, were they ordained using... No, they were ordained in Taiwan in the Chinese tradition. In Chinese tradition and then yeah. adopted. Okay. okay. They adopt the Theravada Vinaya. And then, of course, later on, they will be ordained, some people to be ordained in Sri Lanka, but that was later on, not the, not the senior bhikkhuni. So they do have nuns who've been ordained in Sri Lanka? Yeah, but then they will come back. Yes. Interesting. Okay, yeah. great. And do any of the Thai traditions have nuns? Mm -hmm. Uh, not bikunis, but dam not bikunis. Yes, but the Dhammakaya will have mm -hmm. like a um, lay woman, sort yeah. of living like nuns there. Great, thank you. My other question is about um, you mentioned um the promotion by one nun. So I didn't catch her name of of um uh, gay marriage. Um, yeah. yeah. And okay. um, Taiwan is, Taipei is famous for its amazing pride um, parade. Tell, can you t say a bit about um, Buddhist responses to that and whether there's any particular difference between like, um, you know, say a Burmese Theravada groups and um, local In terms groups. of what? LGBT? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually extreme. Mostly prefer to remain quiet, but the the year leading up to the legalization, the groups that mostly come out strongly against the legalization of same-sex marriage is a religious alliance of religious men from different different religions, and so there are many senior monks who are in that group in that alliance. From different religions, not just not Buddhism. just Buddhism. There are also Christian priests and uh, Taoist priests, yes, and also Chinese monk. So Chinese monks come out. Some of them come very strongly against it, but most Buddhist group, including Theravada, I would say, just prefer to be silent. And so other than the nun you mentioned, it'd be great if you repeated her name, if that's okay. Zhao Hui. Zhao Hui. You made her. You oh, made yes, her. You made her. Yes, she's very 
she's amazing wow okay oh, so other than her were there any vocal advocates from the buddhist community actually no i would think she's probably the only person right. yeah chinese um buddhist groups in taiwan always prefer to stay quiet and out of politics or social or controversial issue Zhao Hui is the only person who is very vocal. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, for, um, perhaps if us, oh, somebody, uh, Liz, Liz, uh, would you mind to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yes, I'm, I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Um, yes, thank you very much for your talk. I found it very um, interesting. Thank and, you. Um, but I missed a little bit of the last um, talk because our, our telephone call came in. But um, so I hope my question hasn't been asked. But um, you spoke about the the kind of anti Mahayana um, kind of sentiments that come from mm -hmm. some um, Theravada Buddhist groups within within Taiwan. Um, and I'd like to ask um, what kind of response to the um, perhaps the Theravada critique. It is coming from um, bodies such as Fuguan Shan and perhaps others. Are they just ignoring it, or are they? Is there a sense in which they are, in some ways, responding to that um, critique or, or the new kind of ethos that's coming in with, with um, Theravada or Mr. Theravada in exclusivism? I would say they mostly just ignore it because most of argument or conflict occurred only in internet. So basically, everybody just doing whatever they want since there, there is no central Buddhist authority here. And there are actually a lot of more new Buddhist groups, what we might call new religious movement in Taiwan than Theravada. So mostly they are just ignored. And the critique will be, very few critique will be like, um, for example, if you want to translate whole Chinese, uh, the whole Pititaka again, people ask, oh, it takes too much money, and also language change. So what is the point of trying to come on new Chinese Buddhist terms? That people will say there's no point. Um, yeah, basically that's it. But most of the people I know, they'll participate in both Mahayana and Theravada. Orthodoxy is more important than orthodoxy, let's say. I, I don't know if I answer your question. I'm sorry, but it's not like um, clearly divide here for the Chinese religious identities. Not so clearly divide. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yes, that's okay. Uh, okay, we have a we have a question we from the chat, and it is: Does original Buddhism also exist in other countries than Taiwan? Did those nuns also took bodhisattva vow in Mahayana traditions? Uh, well, the second question, the nuns, do you refer to the nunning nuns in my slide? If that's the case, I think the answer is yes. They still see themselves as Mahayana nuns, but then they just think Pali, Pali Vinaya being closer to original Buddhism. Therefore, they observe Pali Vinaya. But other than that, they think they are Mahayana. And I think the original Buddhism, the idea of original Buddhism, yes, is shared by many countries. Um, I think Professor Gombridge has written something about that in terms of the history, especially in Sri Lanka at the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a very popular Orientalist view. Yes. OK, um, are there any other questions? Uh, maybe if there are none at this point, I will ask one. Um, can you, we, I'm interested in the, the slides that you showed about the, mm -hmm. uh, the breakdown of people's religious beliefs and the contentions that you described. Right. Um, are, what, what is the number of people who say that they have no religion? in Taiwan. Is that something also tracked? Uh, I think I think the number, the percentage is very low. 
percentage is very low. And also for that, because that survey is conduct, was conducted by Academia Sinica, every four years they did this kind of survey. And then they don't actually ask people what is your religious identity. They will ask that in details, do you believe in karma? Do you believe in um, ancestral worship? Do you believe in God, almighty God, this kind of thing? So that's how they come up with this, tab this table about like, how people actually would believe in different things, different, even if they have one religious identity. And they also found that even people who identify themselves as atheists who actually believe in ancestor worship and karma. So it's not necessarily strictly divided. Yes. Right. Uh, it's interesting. Um, and, and another question is, um, what is the attitude generally in Taiwan to ordaining for religion? Is this something that is seen as uh, high status or very positive or, or weird or, or, or what? Uh, that's difficult to answer. Unless it is a survey, I, don't, I haven't really seen any survey about this. But uh, I think throughout the years, in terms of Buddhist circle that I'm mostly encountering, it become more and more friendly towards people who are ordained into Sangha. But if you are not a Buddhist, if you are just follow, followers of Chinese religion, the idea of being ordained is still very uh, frightening and still being hostile against. Mm, interesting, thank you. Um, I believe that Kate has a question. Hi, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know hog the airway, so please interrupt me, anybody else who wants to talk. I, I was just um, thinking a couple of things about your recent uh, special section on um, transnational Buddhism. Yeah. And one of the um, things that came out of that is the association between Buddhism and um, business, um, so international business, where it, for other groups going elsewhere, Taiwanese groups going elsewhere, but in uh, in the case of Theravada in Taiwan, there seemed to be a strong association with universities rather than business. Is that a correct picture? And my other question is that um, given the one of the distinguishing features between um, Chinese monasticism and Theravada monasticism has been a vegetarian diet, can you say a little bit about how that works out with the Theravada in Taiwan? All right, you mean first question, coming out from university? Uh, oh, yes, I don't suggest that for um, Theravada. That oh, a couple yeah, of the, the monk. Theravada the temples monk. set up there actually were monks who started off going oh, to Taiwan to study yes. university. Um, uh, I think that it is for the foreign, the foreign monk, the, the Thai monks, and the also Sri Lanka monks because that's the easier way to get a visa. Basically, if they are still here, then they can get a student visa and stay here for up 10 years. They might actually stay behind afterwards, after graduation. I'm laughing because I think my first attempt to teach Sanskrit, which Richard will remember, was to Taiwanese nuns. Uh -huh. <laughs> who registered to do a degree in order to get the visa to start their term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and could I ask about then about vegetarianism among Vegetarian. Theravada monastics or Theravada inspired monastics, uh, particularly yeah. actually the group that thinks Theravada Vinaya is more original uh, because presumably then that would counter a vegetarian practice, but I assume no. they are vegetarian. No, no, they are not. At least I in the website they would say they would teach you like oh we will take whatever is given, so they are not strict. They will not ask to be vegetarian, but because the vegetarianism is such a long tradition in Chinese Buddhism, I observe that most devotees would still give uh, vegetarian food dana rather than non-vegetarian food, non-vegetarian meal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're just at 11 o'clock, which is the, the time that the uh, seminar is supposed to end. Uh, Wei Yi, do you have any other, any further time or 
or shall we shall we let you go now? I don't think there is any questions, right? I I see a okay. I see one hand raised from Pamoda. Okay, yeah. Would, would one it be okay? Or two, uh, yes. One more. And there are some comments in the chat. Just a discussion of bodhisattva precepts and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. I see that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Pamoda, do you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yes. Um, actually, uh, uh, I saw a question on the on the chat that was saying that uh, was uh, asking about our other original. Buddhism uh, that exists in other countries yeah. and um, actually in the monastery I am here it's called uh, um, um, sorry <laughs> Sasanaraka Buddhist sanctuary uh, we do uh, we do study early Buddhism so we live according to the Vinaya and right. and we study as well the, okay. the suttas yeah. from the Buddha so I just wanted to mention Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you in Myanmar? Uh, no, in Malaysia. In Malaysia. Oh, Malaysia, of course. So yes. we do speak Chinese as well. Like right. some of the laity followers yeah. speak Chinese. Mm, yeah, mm. I think there is such a um, very frequent exchange between Malaysia and Taiwan. The oh, Malaysian yes. Buddhism and Taiwan Buddhism, yes. We also speak uh, Fujian, Fujian like uh, all yeah. Fujian language. Uh, 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 yes, yes. So we have a lot of common characteristic. Yes. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Uh, we have one comment in the in the chat that perhaps you could comment on, Wei. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, for, from uh, uh, it says uh, thanks for your talk, Wei. I am quite familiar with the Bhikkhu Mohinda's work to rename traditional Chinese Buddhist terms phonetically, coming from right. original Sanskrit to that of Pali. Mm -hmm. But his suggestion has been directed to the translation of Pali texts, not really of the Mahayana texts. So I don't think he be rightly called anti-Mahayana or hostile to uh, Chinese Mahayana Buddhism. Thank you. Well, it's uh, mostly about how it's being interpreted because even though he wants to translate only Pali texts, the problem is that phonetically speaking, pronunciation change. So for people who criticize Mah Mahinda, who say that just because you pronounce this way in Mandarin, in modern Mandarin, doesn't necessarily mean it was pronounced in no, in 1,000 years ago when the sutra was translated. And uh, some people will say that because those Chinese terms are so commonly known already, if we want to translate it again, then you probably just going to alien other people. So if you read his, his, uh, his writings or read or a or watch his video on YouTube. This kind of there are criticism saying that he is very hostile to Mahayana. I so saw that's why I say it's anti Mahayana because he actually said that the Mahayana is Sanskrit and that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't know if you understand what I meant, but that's what I think. Yeah. So is that okay. okay? Right. Okay. Well, um, if there are, are there any other questions? Um, okay. If there are no other questions, um, perhaps we shall shall wind it up here. Kate, right. uh, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, E. Wow, uh, thank you. Thank you also, P, for looking after some of the, the chat and the queries there. Um, so in the meanwhile, as you um, before you disappear, perhaps you could unmute yourselves and turn the videos on and uh, just let uh, Wei Yi know who her audience was and thank her. Thank you very much, Wei Yi. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, where's P? I haven't seen P for a long time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. I'm going to log off now. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.